Hi there, and welcome to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, your host. This is our first episode back in the studio after the coronavirus pandemic that rocked the world for the last two and a half years. I hope you and your family made it safely through, and I imagine, like myself, you're glad that it's over and we're now getting back to life with some level of normalcy. Cybersecurity Today is the only TV show that's dedicated to tackling the subject of computer security in an exciting and thought-provoking manner. Cybersecurity Today is a 30-minute program that uses a talk show newscast format to discuss themes, topics, and current events in the cybersecurity space. If you're not familiar with cybersecurity, this show will provide insight into how to protect and defend computer systems. For those viewers who are current practitioners, this show will provide thought leadership from cyber experts on the direction of the cybersecurity industry. We aim to provide you useful information to a full spectrum of interested parties. Now, let's talk a little bit about the show. The way we have the show broken down is into two basic segments. We'll have our first segment called Cyber Bites. This segment covers a number of current events that are currently occurring in the cybersecurity industry. Then, in our second segment, we'll have two guests come in to the show and talk about cybersecurity education. Today, we have Mr. Vernon Green, Jr., who's the CEO and founder of G-Cubed Incorporated, and Ms. Wendy Bauer, the COO, Chief Operating Officer of G-Cubed Incorporated. They will be talking to us about the work that they are doing in Stafford, Virginia, where they've partnered with local high schools to develop a program called Cyber 4 Plus. And it's really there to help train the next iteration of Cyber Warriors. I think you'll enjoy that section as it may give you some ideas on how to consider pursuing a career in cybersecurity by talking to subject matter experts on how they are helping tackle the cybersecurity workforce challenge. You may have heard that there's a huge workforce deficit in the cybersecurity field. The work that Vernon and Wendy are doing is key to helping fill that gap. And the techniques that they are using by tapping into high school students is really a win-win situation for both the students and the cybersecurity industry. I'm looking forward to talking with both Vernon and Wendy in our second segment. Okay, let's get into the cyber bites and talk about what's going on in the cybersecurity industry. So in current news, keep in mind that October, which is what we're in right now in 2022, is considered Cybersecurity Awareness Month. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, sometimes known as CISA, within the Department of Homeland Security, and the National Cyber Alliance, sometimes called the NCA, have launched an online See Yourself in Cyber campaign to promote better cybersecurity practices. The choices that we make when browsing online can affect the safety when we're at home, when we're at school, or even when we're on the job. That's why CISA and the NCA want to highlight four important cybersecurity rules as part of this See Yourself in Cyber campaign. The first is to recognize phishing that develops in your email. Obviously, don't click on them. The second rule is to update your software on your desktops and even on your mobile devices. Keep in mind that includes both the operating system as well as any local applications. A third rule is to use strong passwords. That would include uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters. And the fourth rule that's facilitated or promoted in this campaign is to enable multi-factor authentication. If you're not familiar with that, that might include using your phone where they send you a code every time you log into a high priority website and or a system. The takeaway is to remember that cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility, and by following these four rules or practices, cyber risks can be greatly reduced. In other news, uh, a new binding operational directive, sometimes called a BOD, that directs federal agencies to keep track of assets and vulnerabilities on their networks six months from now has been released by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. To that end, federal departments and agencies have been tasked with two sets of activities, asset discovery and vulnerability enumeration. 
which are seen as essential steps to gaining visibility into risks facing federal civilian networks that would constitute departments and or federal agencies. These activities involve carrying out automated asset discovery every seven days and initiating vulnerability enumeration across those discovered assets every 14 days. So they've got to be able to detect it every week and then identify weaknesses and flaws, if you will, every two weeks. That needs to be done by April 3rd, 2023. In addition to having the capability to do so on an on-demand basis within 72 hours receiving a request from CISA. The binding operational directive is referred to as BOD 23-01. More information on this BOD can be obtained by visiting CISA.gov. Let's talk about our third news story. Microsoft has confirmed the exploiting of two unpatched exchange server zero day vulnerabilities in real world attacks. Now, if you've not heard of a zero day, a zero day is a vulnerability or a software flaw that is a weakness for which no current patch or update exists from the vendor. A cybersecurity company known as GTSC first discovered the flaws as part of its response to a customer's cybersecurity incident in August of 2022. Uh, the two zero days had been used in attacks on their customers' environments dating back to uh, August 2022. Microsoft, as of today, has declined to say when patches would become available, but noted in a blog post that the upcoming fix is on an accelerated timeline, so they understand the relevance and the importance of releasing an update. Until Microsoft releases patches for these new software vulnerabilities, the company is recommending uh, that customers follow the temporary mitigation measures shared by GTSC, which involves adding a blocking rule in something called IIS Manager. IIS is the Internet Information Server software that's in Microsoft's flagship Windows Server product. Uh, IIS provides core web services that are used to host organizational websites and by extension through Exchange, allow access to an organization's email via web technologies. According to reports, Exchange online customers do not need to take any action because the zero days appear to only impact what we call on-premise Exchange servers. So if your organization still hosts its own Exchange server, that would be considered on-prem. This means that if your organization is using like a cloud-based implementation of Exchange through, for example, Office 365, you're most likely not impacted. Let's talk about our fourth story. Uh, the FBI and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, have released a joint announcement recently expressing confidence that any attempts to manipulate votes on the upcoming election at a scale will be detected and thwarted. Uh, they have identified that any attempts to compromise election infrastructure are considered unlikely to result in any large scale disruptions or ultimately to prevent voting from occurring. The FBI and CISA will continue to quickly respond to any potential threats, provide recommendations to harden election infrastructure, notify stakeholders of threats and intrusion activities and impose risks and consequences on cyber actors seeking to threaten US elections. The agencies that we mentioned um, have added that they have no reporting to suggest cyber activities have ever prevented someone from casting a ballot or compromising any ballot's integrity. Uh, CIS's director, uh, her name is Jen Easterly, in April of 2022 indicated to Congress that election security ranks as a top issue for the agency. Those are our headlines that are making news. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with our two guests, Mr. Vernon Green, Jr. and Miss Wendy Maurer talking about cyber education. We'll see you in just a moment. What about my privacy? It's protected. And the music I listen to? Protected. What about how I wear my hair? And the things I say and write? The Constitution protects your rights. It isn't an old fading piece of paper. It's a living document. The Constitution says there are three branches of government. So we're kind of like the fourth branch of government. We are the future of America. Find out how you can become part of Constitution Day. For me. For all. For real. Constitution Day is every day. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. For our second segment, we're being joined by Mr. Vernon Green, Jr. and Ms. Wendy Maurer. Vernon is the founder and CEO at G-Cubed Incorporated, and Wendy is the COO, Chief Operating Officer of G-Cubed Incorporated. 
Vernon and Wendy, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much for the invite. Thanks yeah. for having us. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about your uh, cyber education program. And I wanted to know, can you maybe start off just giving us a little bit of background about the Cyber4 high school program and how you're using it to help kind of train the next generation of cyber warriors? Uh, absolutely. Um, as a business owner, you know, we're taught that um, you find a problem uh, or and you find the answer to that problem and that brings you success. And so the problem that we were having as a business is not being able to fill our positions because there are lack of qualified professionals out there, whether it's COVID or the great resignation or whatever, there just aren't enough IT and cyber people to go around. And as a small business that puts us in competition with larger businesses who can pay a lot more. So what we've done is tried to be a part of the solution. We went to our uh, Stafford County Public Schools. Um, we went to Germana, the community college, and we started building a pipeline of young talent coming in. But specifically, the Cyber 4 Plus program was, it's very hard to change a curriculum. Um, and so what we've done is come up with certifications and dual enrollment over a four year period to where those kids come in as rising freshmen, graduate with IT fundamentals, IT, uh, I'm sorry, CompTIA, uh, IT fundamentals, CompTIA A+, CompTIA Network+, CompTIA Security+, an associate's degree in their high school diploma in four plus years. Nice, nice. Um, so is there, a specific curriculum for each of the four years or do the students themselves just study it like in one of their four years of high school? So the first two years, uh, their freshman year and their sophomore year are committed towards their regular high school classes with internships, um, working with industry during the summers. Uh, they Once a month, I believe, they meet with my company over the weekend and we do cyber and IT training on Saturday mornings. Uh, but then once they hit their junior and senior year, it gets really buckled down to the dual enrollment, the classes and the education. But the certification portion is freshman year IT fundamentals, sophomore year A+, junior year is Network+, Plus, and the senior year is Security+. Plus. Got it. So um, how do you go about selecting candidates? I mean, I assume there's got to be some level of interest or some level of competency. How do you filter out who's an ideal candidate at the high school level for this kind of program? Great question. Um, this this really this program is by application, so they have to apply to be included into the program. Then we come together, and there are, is a rubric and criteria. Um, we do have an emphasis on um, students that are on free and reduced lunch to tr that don't normally have access to these types of programs and can't afford them on their own. Um, but it's a combination of grades, performance. Um, there is a, a written application where they have to tell us why they should be put in, um, and then letters of recommendation from their teachers or their community. And so that selection process was very uh, intensive, um, but we came out with our first cohort of 20 students. Understood, understood. Can you guys maybe speak a little bit about how many schools are being engaged in the program? Is it one school? Is it uh, a litany of schools? How many, how many are we talking about? So right now it's a pilot program. So we've got 20 students. The uh, Stafford County Public Schools has five high schools. <laughs> and so the students are coming out of, you know, a, a smattering of, of the high schools. But because this is such a pilot program, uh, they are taking applications right now for, for next year's cohort. cohort. And uh, so it's, it, you know, it's they're testing the waters right now. What are we seeing in terms of uh, pass rates, success rates? Uh, how are they doing in terms of the cohort that you guys are currently training? That, that's an, another great question. One of the difficulties that we've had is how do we measure our performance? Um, and because this is the first cohort that just started, Right now, um, there aren't a lot of metrics for us to judge our uh, progress yet. Yeah. Um, but what we are saying is the engagement level, the level of interest, uh, the level of activity they have with our us as an industry partner um, has all been fantastic so, so far. Additionally, we have been approached by other counties, other states to try and partner and stand up these same types of programs in other ex educational uh, entities uh, across, actually across three states so far. 
Another emphasis that is kind of important to note is they've got a lot of parental involvement with these kids. So we had over the summertime a at what was it, a three-day um, program that the parents had to attend with their students where we brought in mentors from all different companies. So now we've got other industry partners involved in this and they're coming from Maryland. It's interesting, we just, one of the mentors that reached out to Vernon, Vernon um, had put out a call to action on LinkedIn to find mentors, and one of them came from Maryland, drove all the way down to Stafford County from Maryland. We just hired him as a, a subcontractor on one of our contracts. So for business, it also works out, but um, it's really nice to see the amount of parental involvement that is also in this program, because parents know that, that the real jobs are in IT. IT is everywhere in everything that we do. And so, so they want to want their children, you know, to get into the program and get through the program. Let's talk a little bit about funding for it. Uh, are you guys <laughs> sponsoring it, or are you able to tap into like do do the do the students have to pay for any of it, or ultimately, let's get down to the brass tacks. Absolutely, Who pays for it? Oh, absolutely. You're getting ready to start a fight between so, Vernon and I. <laughs> So the, the truth of the matter is, is that the program was initially started and funded by a grant. Part of that grant is to determine sustainability. And so as an industry partner, um, we've, uh, we've gotten together with Stafford County Public Schools and Germana, and we figured this program to cost approximately $6,000 per student. Now that's not a lot, that's, that's not a lot at all. But that six, to make it even better, that $6,000 is for the student across the four plus years. So we're saying that $6,000 per student gets them the certifications, their high school diploma, and their associate's degree. That's really not bad. So for the first cohort of about 20 students across the four years, we're looking at about $120,000. And right now, um, as Wendy said, no. I am looking to be the first sponsor <laughs> to support that first cohort. Um, we're the first year. Right now, <laughs> as my COO for the first year, but I want to own the first cohort. Um, I want to put my money where my mouth is and say that this is important. Um, and it is, we as a company believe that this is a direct threat to national security, not having enough IT and cyber professionals to defend our cyber boundaries. So this is one of the things that I truly believe in. So that spawns an interesting kind of connection to my next question. Since you're putting your money where your mouth is, what do you expect to get out of it? You know, a lot of times organizations look at investment, we put in money, we get something out of it. Yeah. I guess really what we're trying to, I want to know is what kind of knowledge, skills, and abilities do you expect that this investment is going to facilitate to, to those students so that ultimately they can go out there and become gainfully employed? So we have had an internship program where we have attracted high school students and college students to come into our company uh, during the summers, during the winters, uh, to you know learn IT. To um, and then <clears throat> at some point, what we will do is we'll sponsor them for a security clearance. So we've been doing this for years. We've got one individual, Jair, who's one of our favorite employees. He is now a lead on on our acquisition command contract. He's 26 years old. He spent two years in high school and all four years of college interning with our company. We got him a security clearance early on, which actually has a dual benefit of providing him an opportunity to kind of not do the bad stuff in college because he has a security clearance. So it's got a chilling effect on, on his behavior. And, um, and he is very successful and one of our customers favorite employees and we have a litany of stories from our interns that um, have been very successful employees of our company and because we get them so early we get to inculcate them in our culture and uh, they become extremely loyal and have been with us for quite some time. Additionally, um, just from a, a cost perspective, we get to hire these kids uh, coming out, and I, I mean that in a loving way, these kids coming out in a way that is cheaper for us, more money than they've ever made, but cheaper for us to get them spun up and give them a salary rather than going to the market and, and where the talent is extremely expensive because everyone's competing for those uh, few resumes. 
Um, the demand is very high for these professionals. So the cost is very high. The way we are doing this, we're building a workforce that allows us to also manage our cost. So you brought up an interesting point there relative to jobs, right? So being gainfully employed, uh, worrying about the marketplace. Mm -hmm. What kind of jobs do you guys envision that they're going to be able to go and do for G Cubed Incorporated? Or I assume you're probably not going to hire all 20 of the individuals. There, some of them may want to go off and do other types of things. Mm -hmm. Where will they? Where will they land? What kind of positions do you envision that they will actually take on? I honestly target them towards entry level positions. So we're talking about help desk, desktop support. We're talking about things that are gonna get them into the environment and help them experience an IT environment. And then after they get in, that's when you can grow them into different areas, whether it's network, whether it's system, uh, system um, engineering, whether it's uh, system administration, database management. And so because we have all of these areas within our company, um, getting them exposed uh, helps to help them figure out what it is they really want to do. And so then we have what we call an individual development plan that every one of our employees uh, fills out. And basically it's where a GQ manager and the employees sit down and figure out, well, what are you trying to do in your career? And then take that and line it up for what we need as a company and where they touch, we make those requirements. And so when your performance evaluation comes around, you're being graded on the exact um, requirements that you agree to at the beginning that align with your development. Do you guys envision that you'll kind of build this program out and maybe bring in other companies as well to help kind of Absolutely. act as that feeding mechanism out to uh, private industry? That is the hope. And quite frankly, um, the governor came out to our offices to, to celebrate our nonprofit and Mr. Green and the efforts that we have been doing within the community. And uh, that's where we're getting the first 30,000 from. Is, and this uh, is Governor Youngkin of Governor Virginia, Youngkin, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, nice. And uh, nice. he donated 43,000 to our organization. And that is more than likely going to be where we source the funds for the first year of the co cohort. But in order for this to really scale and be sustainable, there is a demand for these employees. There is a demand for this workforce. And other companies, as soon as the word gets out, I am more than certain, will jump on board and provide funding as well. Are there any costs that a student that would be interested in the program would have to absorb or take on? How do you how do you handle that? It's all being handled by the employer? Yes, really, there's no cost to the student. The costs are covered by the school district uh, and the partners of the school district. We as an industry partner make sure that we're contributing. Um, we are doing um, creative things to try and keep the program going. And if there's anyone that would like to get more information, please come to our website and we'll be glad to, um, to provide all the funding sources and everything that's, that's happening out there to support this program. And what is that website? www.g3cs.org. That's golf 3 charliesierraorg so I know that this is a, a personal program for you guys, but do you envision it really moving outside of Stafford at some point? You want to see it go statewide, nationwide? What, what, are you, what are your big vision ideas for the program itself? One of the things that we really believe in is um, we were able to put together this program because we know the people, we know the players, we have you know, deep relationships with the school board members, the board of supervisors, the superintendent. And so we've been able to be very successful in Stafford County. We don't envision ourselves going national. What we would encourage is if somebody finds this program to be something that they wanna do within their own community, that we are more than happy to provide the template. Stafford County is more than happy to provide the template because we do believe that this is something that's going to help kids, it's going to help the industry, and, and quite frankly, help in the protection and defense of our nation. So you guys both talked about the website, and I'm thinking that more from like a parent's perspective or a sponsor's perspective, but what if you're a student in Stafford County and you're watching TV right now and you say, wow, that sounds really interesting. And I'm going to one of those high schools. 
How do they get involved and what's that process look like for them as individuals? G great question. Um, and so the schools are putting this out um, through their uh, counselors and through their activities uh, programs. Um, because this cohort started over uh, last year, it started at the end of um, the school year last year. And so it came out then. It will be coming out again at the end of this school year for the next cohort that starts next year. So talk to your teachers, talk to your uh, guidance counselors and your activity coordinators, and they will have the information. It is an application process. Yeah. They can also uh, just Google Cyber 4 Plus, and uh, it is in the career and technical education portion of Stafford County Public Schools website. So we've got about 20 seconds left. I've got to ask this question because it's on my list. What is the why for this program? Everybody's always got a why and why they're doing something. I don't I don't know that we necessarily, we kind of touched on it, but I want to hear it from your, from your guys' own mouths. A couple of things. One, as a, from a business perspective, it makes good sense. It's good business. From a community perspective, it changes lives and provides opportunities. And third, it's just the right thing to do. And we pride ourselves on trying to do the right thing. All right. Well, Vernon, Wendy, thanks for coming into the show and sharing uh, this phenomenal program with our audience. And uh, we'll have to get you back here, hopefully, in a future episode to kind of touch base to see where things are actually at. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So, guys, that's going to do it for today's episode. We hope you found the information presented in today's show useful and you learned something new about cybersecurity. We want to thank our two guests, Mr. Vernon Green and Ms. Wendy Maurer, for coming in and sharing their expertise with us today. If you'd like to learn more about the show and keep tabs on upcoming episodes, please check out our show's website at cybersecuritytoday.org. We look forward to seeing you at our next episode. Have a great day. Thank you.